So I just want to say thanks a lot for having me here, and uh, I'm looking forward to this. Hopefully everyone will enjoy this. So our presentation, Exploration of Cellular-Based IoT Technology. Again, my name is Daryl Hyland. I am a principal security researcher at Rapid7. I've been there about 10 years. So before we start, I just want to put a shout out. Uh, Carla, Carlotta Bidner, uh, a friend of mine, has been a co-researcher on this cellular project. And also, I want to make a shout out to Damien. Uh, he did a presentation at Hack in Paris in uh, 2018, and in that he talked about transposing images to figure out the layout of circuit boards. And we kind of used that in here also, so I just want to give him credit for that. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first part we want to talk about is what we typically see in IoT devices. There's two standards of cellular modules that are used. There's MB IoT and LTEM. Uh, significant difference between the two, MB IoT, MB1, MB2 have kind of a lower bandwidth. They're half duplex. You often see these being used in devices that do telemetry data and only telemetry data. An example of that would be GPS trackers. So you definitely see these in GPS trackers. The next one is LTM, LTM1, M2. These particular cellular modules that we see are higher bandwidth, as you can see in the picture, uh, one in four megabits. They can actually move real data, uh, things like images, audio, video. You can make phone calls across these particular devices. And in this case, they also support full duplex communication. So that's the typical two devices that I've seen in almost every IoT device that we've actually tore down and took a look at. So let's dig, oh, oh, the other part of this is we talked about uh, release 13, 14, and 15 that laid out those. But since then, the 3GPP group has come out with other releases, 15, 16, 17. The core devices never really changed. What they ended up adding was more resources, more functionality. An example of that is like small cell support or 5G support. So it's kind of keep the technology moving forward, keep it up with what's changing in the cellular world. But other than that, the core devices haven't really changed much. So why are we here? Besides talking about cellular, to give you an idea, why did I do this? What was our purpose in this? The goal is to get an understanding of cellular in IoT, because we're seeing more and more of these devices show up with cellular. An example would be uh, home security systems will actually have uh, cellular capability for backhaul. We actually have camera systems that are purely cellular. So we're seeing more and more devices start building cellular in there. Medical devices is an example. I just got a, a device shipped to my house. It happens to be a blood pressure cuff that you would give to you know, a family member. And all the data is cellular based up to the cloud makes it possible for the doctors to review that, family members to review that, things like that. So more and more transition towards cellular for the communications. One of the things I like to do anytime I'm looking at a new technology or an advancement of technology is literally tear it apart. I want to tear it down top to bottom, figure out how it's built, how it's constructed, how I can interact with it. And the goal of that is to be able to teach other people to understand the technology. So much everyone's into, hey, let's a buffer overflow or format string or flaw or some other attack. But often you can leverage technology against itself. So if you really, really understand how it works, it gives you the ability to go much farther in your testing and your examination of that technology for security purposes. So literally, let's take it apart, figure out how it works, figure out how we can communicate with it, how we can actually leverage the technology itself to carry on further attacks or testing within the environment. So as it says here, IR ovens, hot plates, hot air reflow, let's take the device apart, let's see what it's made up of. So we start taking the shield off, we find out components are packed in there pretty good. Every time I get a device that has a cellular module type in it, I go buy extras and I throw it into an oven. I strip it bare of all of its components and I start reverse engineering the circuit board's layout so I can see how the components are laid out. Can an attacker, if he wanted to, 
gain more access, most of these devices are LGA devices, land grid array devices. So all of the connections of the circuit board are underneath it. So to keep from taking it off the circuit board, can I find access to usable data by taking the shield off and going in from the top? So literally, that's what we do. We figure the LGA layout, we strip the board, we start figuring out the components. Flash memory, start figuring out the CPU, and then we delve into things like, hey, can I get access to JTAG on this device? So we start mapping out the JTAG from that circuit level and then trace it out on the surface of the board and go, hey, can I get access to things like this without doing other more intrusive stuff? Now, obviously, that's intrusive, <laughs> okay? We've destroyed a chip, but hey, I've lost count of the number of chips I've totally destroyed, so. Here's a memory chip. So you have a memory chip on these devices. It uh, happens to be a multi-chip package. A multi-chip, so if you look at the pin layout and you're familiar with this, it looks just like a 162 ball BGA embedded multi-chip package. The thing is, this does not have an internal embedded controller on it. So you just can't pull it off, drop it into a reader, and mount it up as a file system. It's a little more complex than that. What we want to do is, hey, I want to get memory off this. The chip reader sockets cost about 800 bucks a piece. Every one of them is different size. That means every one of these chips, the pinout pitch is the same, but the body of the chip will change. 8 by 10 millimeters, 9 by 11 millimeters, 13 by 11 millimeters. So if you have to die a different, buy a different socket for every one, the money goes up. You start looking at several thousand euros to get sockets for this. And I'm cheap. I like to do things the cheap way. Not necessarily the easy way. But there's a method to my madness, and, and I've published it, and you'll see that in a minute. So what we do is you get a pin, light, pin diagram for the device. Now, these particular chips, there are no data sheets for them. But I was able to find a pinout. The pinout for this manufacturer and the other manufacturers are all the same. The reason why is if the chip's not available, a manufacturer of a module will go buy it from another manufacturer and just drop it into place. So then what we do is we map that to the chip. And then we ball the chip. So we put balls on the chip. We can see it here. So we add balls to the chip. And the purpose of that, I found out, instead of trying to just solder straight to it with a wire, which is mad, OK? It's not that easy. But once you put the balls on there, you can take fine gauge wire, like 40 gauge wire, press it against the ball, tap it with a solder iron, and it instantly connects to it. And we can wire up one of these chips on our microscope fairly quickly. And then, well, we're dealing with the fact that we don't have the data sheet on this. But I found out if you go buy it, get the sales slick, you can find out critical information about the chip silicon. How big it is, bit speed, its rate, its function, structure, all that for an AND flash. And then what you do is you go to same manufacturer, and you look through all of his chips, different package styles, and try to find a chip that has that same specifications. Because companies do not produce new silicon. They reuse the same silicon and just put it in a different body. So then you go ahead, and I built out a 48-pin ZIF socket. I go to the manufacturer. I find a TSOT 48 that uses the same silicon, or at least I think uses the same silicon. I wire it up like it does, and then I try to read it with a chip reader. I'd say about 50% of the time, it'll tell me it has the same chip identifier between the two chip bodies. And then it reads no problem. If it says that it doesn't match, I say ignore it, run anyways. I have yet to have this not work and not able to dump all the memory off these chips using this process. It works fairly well. Down at the bottom is a link uh, to a blog or a paper where I go through this entire process. And like I said, the ultimate goal is to process this stuff to the point where other people can repeat it and learn from it. So that data is out there. 
uh, and it's very effective actually able to pull memory off these chips. So then we want to get into kind of the interaction with the hardware. So when you want to talk to a cellular module, ooh, wrong slide. I'm a little ahead of myself, I apologize. So you want to interact with the actual hardware. What you want to do is a process that Damien talked about at TAC in Paris in 2018. You want to actually make an opposite image of the back side of the board and then transpose them over each other. And by setting these at like 50% density and then overlaying them, you can see the reference between all the components on one side or the other side. It makes it easier for tracing out critical things on the board that you want to uh, tap into and actually look at. To take it to another level, I go ahead and get the actual land grid array for the cellular module, and I overlay it. Now quickly, I can look at this and go, hey, the yellow boxes up there are UART. The coral boxes in the lower left-hand corner are USB. Now I know where everything's connected on the board, and the most likely place that I'm going to have areas that I can connect into to access the USB and the UART. And it's very effective. I use this on a regular basis. It simplifies. It saves me a little bit of time because sometimes these chips are oriented, these modules are oriented very different on the boards, and you can easily be trying to trace out something on one side of the board or one end of the board when in reality it's on the other end of the board. And this makes it easier to get that image in your head and target the right area on the board. So then we start thinking, you know, I'm sitting in my lab at home and I'm like, okay, so we can trace it out. What happens if the manufacturer, the circuit board this module is attached to, design a really well board? And that board, all of the connections that I'm interested in looking at are not on the surface, they're on a sublayer. So they go from the LGA, which is underneath the chip body, they go over to the CPU, who's a BGA, and everything's one of the sublayers, and I can't get access to it. So I started thinking about this. And I'm thinking, these modules are fairly good size. The cool thing is if you look at these land grid array, all of the critical stuff is always on the outer edges always on the edge, outer edges. So I started thinking, what if, and you can see them there in that picture there, you can see the actual land grid arrays along the edge. What if I used acupuncture needles? <laughs> so I went out and uh, you can't normally in the US buy acupuncture needles because they're like medical things, but you can buy these things that are used to clean out Printers, 3D printers, that are basically the same acupuncture needles. They just label them as non-medical and you can buy them. You get them in different sizes. I think I have 0.1 millimeter, 0 0.15, 0.2, 0.3, and 0.35 in my lab. And what you do is you make up a rig and you insert it underneath the edge of the chip and attach to the critical communication circuits you want to talk to. This works pretty good, especially on the smaller modules. I did notice on some of the larger modules where the land grids are further up underneath. They may be upwards of two and a half millimeters. Sometimes when these are put on the board, the actual modules have a tendency to cup. And when they cup, they close up the edge and makes it difficult to do that. But they don't always do that. So if there's a gap along the edge, Acupuncture needles will let you tap into those circuits very effectively. Capture data and communicate with the module if you need to. So circuit board communication. So how do you communicate to a cellular module? So I don't know, how many people in here are familiar with old modems, AT commands on modems? Okay, we, we have a few. Well, it turns out, that most RF devices have that capability, including these. These are completely controlled and managed via AT commands. Now, if you're looking at the old Hayes AT compatible AT command structure, it's not the same. This is way more advanced. There's way more 
commands that can be sent to these devices to actually uh, control them. Another important fact, if you have a device that takes AT commands and you get an AT command manual for it, it'll list all the commands, all the data, well, not all the commands, and that seems to be the problem. It turns out on a lot of these cellular modules, there can often be a number of commands that aren't listed in the AT manuals. So to solve this problem, me and my friend Carlotta went out and gathered all the AT command manuals for each manufacturer and compiled them into a list. And then we wrote some Python script, which is at the end of this slide deck, there'll be a link for that uh, that list, and we wrote some uh, scripts that we can connect into the modules and run all these AT commands in the standard help check mode, which basically it's a command that actually will say, does this command exist, and what is its syntax? And we can easily scan a device and figure out what are all the AT commands that do work. And the cool thing is, there's a lot of cool commands in there, and they're not always documented in the manual, which we're gonna show here. So the communication types on cellular modules are USB and UART. So there's generally three types of communication capabilities on these devices. It's often USB high-speed interchip, which is 480 megabits per second. And then there's also, I, I list a couple other there because they do exist. There is an ESUB, which is an embedded USB structure. I haven't really seen them on modems, but I've seen them on other devices. And then you can see standard. The difference between the standard and the high-speed interchip typically is related to the fact that on standard, there is a negotiation that takes place on the bus to figure out and assign an ID to a, a device because you can have multiple devices on a USB bus. Thing is, when you're looking at interchip communications, there is not typically multiple devices on the bus, there's one. You have the CPU and the device is talking to. So there's no need to negotiate. And that's where high-speed interchip's kind of a, a, a subset of standard. Then you have UART. You have two different UARTs on a cellular module. You have an external debug UART. You can tap into that and you can watch the device boot up. Often a lot of those will actually have a logon prompt. You can actually log on the device if you know the password. The other one, which is called main UART, is an inner chip UART. It'll go from a microprocessor to the module. Now, both of these are used for communication and data, but they're never used at the same time. So a device is designed to use USB. It'll send commands, it'll send data, it'll send control information. Or it uses UART to do the same thing. Yeah, I've never seen a device that'll actually do both. So if you can identify communication on either one of these, you can make the assumption the other one's not gonna be used. Often I found them to be completely disconnected in the circuit. There's no runs or traces associated with those. The device we're gonna show today in our demo videos, it did actually have both of them connected, but only USB was used. Even though the UART was connected to the CPU, it did nothing, no responses on it from the CPU. There was response on it from the other thing. So when both of these are up there, even though one's not used, let's say USB is being used, which is our example today, the UART can still be connected to it and take commands and take data. So it makes for an interesting vector for you to control the device. So when we start talking about interchip communications, there's a couple key things to think about. So we're looking at this here. This would be how that CPU's uh, main UART connects to the EG91 module. If you wanted to listen to traffic on this, and it was a normal full traffic UART, main UART, the thing is, is you can't hook it up like a regular UART. You're gonna have to listen to RX on both sides, but remember, both sides are communicating both directions. The CPU's talking and the module's talking, and it goes back and forth. So you have to use two FTDI devices, connect up to the device, and then you're able to capture data. But if I wanna communicate to the device, I wanna send commands to the device, it has to be done a little different. It turns out you have to sever the circuit. 
Standard UART communications, if they're connected on both ends, and you hook to it, will not take your commands. It's an electronic thing. Go figure. Unless, there is one exception. I did document it in a paper. If there is a terminating resistor or an impedance matching resistor on both sides of this between the devices, or a voltage translator, because one's 1 1.8 or 3.3, Often in those cases, you can hook your, your, your own FTDI device up there and put a resistor, a terminating resistor in the circuit yourself, and you can also communicate. So it's about 75% of the time, 80% of the time, I see them directly connected. I don't see any resistors in place. In those cases there, you're gonna have to cut the runs, connect into it with the device. So, and, and that's pretty straightforward. So if we start thinking about this, Here's an example here. So this is the device we're going to show today. So we trace everything out. We see we have a transmit and receive right here. So we connect wires here. We go further up the runs. We follow up the runs, connect two more wires, and then just cut the runs. And if you have a device that's actually using the UART for real communications, cutting the runs is typically a bad thing. So the solution to that is, we actually put into it a control board. We pull everything out here. Control board gives us wire strips. Uh, I build these like, oh gosh, all the time. So I have tons of these laying in my lab and it has on and off switches. So it gives us the ability to hook everything up, turn the switches on so communications let the device run normal. And at some point when we want to send a command, open it up, send our commands, and close it back up. Most of the time there's no latency issues you will once in a while encounter a device that sends out a lot of watchdogs. And if it misses like three watchdogs, it'll reset the device. You gotta watch for that uh, when you're working with these devices. So now that we've taken this device, just so you know what this device is, so I brought one in. It happens to be a trail camera used for cap capturing wildlife in the woods is what this device is. There's no sense in not knowing what it is. I know you can see it's a camera, but hey. <laughs> so then we take the thing apart, we've cut the runs, we've rerouted UART. This particular device uses USB for all of its commands, and we're gonna look at the USB traffic here shortly. But since it uses USB for all of its commands, we know it doesn't use UART. So literally we can cut the runs, leave the circuit open, we don't have to work, worry about that. So we have a quick little video here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna power the device up and we're gonna see a ready command come from the, micro or from the uh, cellular module. When it powers up, it's gonna send some commands out on both channels. The CPU cares less about this one. It cares about the one that's on the other side. So when it sends out the ready command, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start talking to it. This happens to be uh, Quetel uh, EG91. We hook the wires in, we cut the runs, all the fancy wires. I like the breakout boards because I can put, put all these headers on there and I can hook any kind of test gear into this device that I need to for whatever I'm doing. And I'm using really small 1.8 volt uh, FTDI devices on this that are easy to mount on a circuit board uh, for design. And there we go, me pointing at that, so that's cool. But let's go ahead and we're gonna power it up and then we're gonna see a ready command come up. So what I did in this, so when we fire it up and we get a ready command up here, I'll send an AT command to make sure that it's okay and everything's fine. Okay, we got a ready command. I put an AT command in there and then I can just start sending AT commands to it, okay. So we instantly see that I can actually check the configuration. I can see who it's connecting to. And then out of kicks, I went ahead and actually carried out an FTP transaction. I connected to the internet, to an FTP server on the internet. While this device is still being a trail camera, that functionality has never changed. And I actually had it bring down a directory listing on a device. This particular command's not in the command manual. There's a lot of communication commands that were not in the manual. So you can see now, even though the device is functioning normal, it came up ready. 
through other monitoring, we validate that it connected out, registered to the cell service, everything's working. And that's based on some of those commands I ran there, showed me that the connections were there and everything was synced up properly. At that point, I could do whatever I want with this device. It's gonna carry out my cans, my transactions. Um, so the next thing I wanna look at is USB. So we know the UART's there, we know we can communicate with it. What does USB communications look like? This was more problematic. This took me a while to get around to figuring it out appropriately. There is a lot of, there is a lot of USB sniffers out there that are open source, but I assure you, I don't think any of them can do inner chip communication sniffing. Almost all of them are passed through devices. So you have to have a USB device, a machine, and then you put the listener in between. Well, we can't do that here. When you get into circuit design related to USB communication, I think the limitation is really short, like 10, less than 10 centimeters, like three, four centimeters on a circuit board. If you extend it out beyond that without proper termination, it'll quit working. And if you try to put a device in between it, route it off, route it like we did with the UART, it won't work. So it turns out I ended up picking up a device called a Beagle. This is the only manufacturer I could actually find that said their device is capable of inner chip communication sniffing on the USB bus unless you want to spend 10 grand. This, on the other hand, was not cheap. This was probably 1,200 euros, so not cheap. So I'm looking for open source solution out there that somebody may be aware of that will do inner chip. I just don't want to spend 1,000 euros, 2,000 euros buying devices to find out they don't work. So if you have a device, try this out. <laughs> Let me know, and I'll share it with the community. But for you to communicate to this device, we traced out the USB runs on the device. It's often to see terminating resistors. At least that's what I thought these were, terminating resistors on the circuit between a CPU and a cellular module. Turned out that these are zero resistance resistors. So basically jumpers they put in place. But to make this device work, you can't just tap into a circuit. It will load the circuit down. Manufacturer said, put a 20 to 40 ohm resistor in place. So that's what we did. We soldered in a couple 20 ohm, or 33 ohm in this case, 33 ohm resistors in the circuit. And then we go ahead and we can hook our wires into that to our device as we see hooked up here. Since there was no five volts, uh, USB five volts tappable on the device, that's why you see the red back wire. I just fed back into the Beagle device, five volts to tell it like, yeah, there's like a device there uh, to trick it. So we have a video here and it's gonna go showing, capturing the USB traffic. And when I first filed this up, man, I was like, my wife thought I'd gone crazy. It's like, yeah. It's like screaming and running around because I actually got a device that would do it right. Um, so when we start this out, uh, I know I'll, I'll expand some of these out so you can see more of the detail. I apologize. It's kind of hard to adjust this stuff out, but let's take a look at what's going on here. So we just powered up the device and we're seeing all this data, but we're all seeing, seeing USB communication traffic all mixed in there. We don't want that. So we can come over here and actually pick data and filter it only. So instantly we can stream out all of the information that's USB communications uh, and actually only get the data. So we're seeing all the commands hit the actual cellular module. Some of the same commands you see me run from the UART console. And this is all coming from the CPU. And the CPU is very verbose, as you can see. It's repeating the commands over and over and over and over. So it's constantly using that as a watchdog to make sure the circuit is up and everything's running. That happens to be the firmware version that is on the chip. So there's commands you can get the firmware version that the chip's on. And I think here eventually, I actually had, the, it took me a while to get this thing to start triggering, taking pictures and sending them to the cloud. But eventually it actually did. It's still thinking about it, come on. 
You know, when you film these things for video, you think, this will go fast. Then you stand in front of 500 people, and it's like, it's thinking about it. So we can go ask you, we can search all the data. So we're looking for Bucket, because I know Bucket happens to be an Amazon S3 Bucket name. So here we can actually see the keys. Uh, as you notice as we go through this, I do not show you enough that you could break in and steal all of my stuff. Okay. So that's half of one of the keys. And you'll see this was kind of cool. So we get in here, we can see we have the S3 Amazon Cloud. We can see the location, the bucket names, trail camera. It has a key name. And I don't think I show the password. Apparently the device has a password and all that stuff. So literally I can capture all the communications, which is considered in this case, machine to machine communications. And now I can take it offline. You know, if I'm testing a product or testing the ecosystem for somebody, now I have enough data. I can connect straight up to that S3 bucket and start testing to see if it's secure. Because now I've captured all the comms on how this thing works. Let's go ahead and move forward. So, this brings up an interesting story. And the story goes like this. When I run and start looking at devices, most of the, a certain percentage of devices just connect to the internet via cellular comms. But not all of them do. We run into some that have actually started using private connections. So it'll be private VLAN or private cloud connections. So this device doesn't do it, but I've seen devices not too long ago that actually did this. And what that means is when they connect to the cloud or connect to these private connections, people from the internet can't get to it. The only thing you can get to it is through this machine. And now we've actually showed that we can control the machine. So in that private VLAN, we start thinking about it. We have a device that connects out, and if this is purely private, all of these key systems in the back end, the machine has access to it. We don't have access to it. Well, until now. <laughs> okay? What we can do with the device, this device has a ton of really cool commands. So again, we had tapped into it, we cut the runs, we moved the data out. Let's have a little, little fun. So what I wanted to do is, is this thing had socket capability. Now I assure you there's way more possibilities here. This is just scraping the search circuit. And I was wanting to know, hey, can I build a port scanner and use the modem to do port scanning for me? So I wrote a script. The script's fairly simple. It opens up a socket. It connects to a port. It gets a response back whether the port's open or closed closes the port, moves on to the next one. So we're going to do a quick example, and here's kind of the commands, or the error messages that can come back. So you get a lot of different error messages. So we're going to go ahead and kick this off. So we're listening up here, and we see we ended up got a ready command. So we're going to close it. We know the modem's up running, and now we're going to run our scanner. And it connects out, and we got a 0, zero. port 80 is open. We know that now. Port 3389 is closed. There's only two ports open on this particular device I'm pointing this at. This was a device I had legal access to do this to on the internet, so I got to worry about things like that. As you can see, maybe not the fastest scanner in the world, but if I'm connecting into back end virtual cloud services, or if I'm connecting to through a private VLAN to a subset of critical systems that are only accessible by this device or maybe even other devices, then I think this is sufficient. We can quickly analyze, see what ports are open, and then use the device as a pivot point into that private virtual cloud, private VLAN. So, uh, so I don't know if you guys caught them all, Port 80 was open and port 22 was open. The rest of them were closed in this particular case, in this example. So what other possible capabilities are there? 
I think in this case here, this particular device also has the ability to set up a USB Ethernet. I haven't done that yet. It's on the list of things to do. So can I establish a completely functioning Ethernet where I can actually send data out? The other thing we can think about during this whole attack vector is, since we have this level of access, we have the ability to pull all the configurations out of the device, off the modem. We're able to pull all of the other critical data from the cloud because we can capture USB by doing interchip communication analysis. Now we could easily port all this out to a breakout board and then take it to the next level. Now we have the ability to authenticate all, to all these components, all of these type of things, and then possibly we could turn that into basically an Ethernet port. And I think that's doable here with a little more research and time. Not sure where we're at on time. Oh, looks like we got 10 minutes, so I'm a little ahead of myself. But let's kind of move on. So we happen to have some listed items here. Uh, I recommend checking them out. I will be releasing a paper here right before DEF CON on the cellular stuff where we kind of expand out more on some of the stuff because it's kind of hard to do it all in 45 minutes. But you can gain access to this data. It's all available online. Please check it out. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, reach out through me email. If you have any questions, feedback, input, do not hesitate to reach out to me. I am very much a community-driven person. All of my research is open source. I share it freely with everybody. Uh, and I'm excited uh, to take this project even further or find other people who've done similar things or are working on other things. So, so kind of in conclusion, as you can see, by looking at devices via interchip communications, USB, UART, we can capture a wealth of information and get a good understanding of what end-to-end -end security looks in this technology. Versus attacking it externally, we go from the inside out. We also have the ability to change, configure, and modify the functionality of a device through interchip communications. And the cellular modules are brilliant. I mean, with the amount of command sets that are available, everything that device does is being done through AT commands. All the capture, all the tunnels, all the commands, all the structure, all the communication of data, it's all being done through AT commands. Take those AT commands and the sky's the limit on what you could possibly get these devices to do. So I, I hope you guys found this interesting and useful. Thank you very much. Will you do Q&A? Yeah, I'll take questions. Do you have any questions? Please raise your arm, stand up. Hello. Well, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I was just wondering, what is the most unexpected thing you ever found on an IoT device in terms of backdoors or undocumented <laughs> functionality? Yeah, undocumented functionality on IoT devices is some, uh, something I always look for. Unfortunately, I never find as much as I want. Uh, but I had a device a number of years ago that was being uh, associated with press was actually using these panic buttons, which were cellular-based. Panic buttons to actually be protected from being kidnapped by Colombian drug lords in Colombia, South America. And they wanted me to look at these things. I found out with a single SMS command, I could flush the device, reconfigure it, turn it into a listening device and a tracking device through SMS messages. And then the next step was, well, how do I identify what the SMS message phone number is? I found out I could identify the phone number address range, and I found an undocumented command that hadn't been quite implemented completely. And when I sent that command, the device would error out with an SMS response back to me that I could fingerprint it as a listening device. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's crazy things uh, from the area of undocumented commands. And I think everyone needs to at least try to find those. When you get into that firmware, it's one of the things I look for. 
Um, and in the case with this, it's not that the commands are not documented. They are documented by these manufacturers. They don't list them always in the AT manuals for that particular product, but they still exist. Yes. Hey, Damien. Hi. I uh, was just wondering if you have ever tested, uh, you know, uh, just um, some kind of AT, command, uh, AT module emulation by just unplugging the Quacktail module, for instance, and then emulate it with something in order to see what's going on or make the device believe that something has happened. Well, the one thing, the, the one thing so, so one of the things I tell manufacturers, it turns out that many of these cellular modules do not contain all the information to make them run for that product. It's all sent from the CPU. The thing is, is many of these modules have the capability of having a file system and a secure file system. So I always recommend the manufacturers at some point, either at the manufacturing process or the initial pairing process of the device to actually push that stuff into the secure file system structure. Unless you know the name of it, you can't get it back out. But I've only had one of them actually take me up on it. Uh, and I think, I think that's critical because, because, as you can see, I could just listen to it and we get everything underneath the sun. Uh, but if they leverage the devices at their level of capability, and I think this one actually has a secure file system too for actually putting config files. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I guess we're done. Thank you very much, Daryl Halen.